We seem to be in a world where some of the most dominant companies in the world are technology companies, and we have built powerful platforms such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft in America, and Alibaba and Tencent in China. These companies all have wide moats, strong brands, and are led by brilliant and <laughs> entrepreneurs. That's good. <laughs> my, my question to you is this. If Berkshire is to honor its tradition of investing in wide modes and strong brands, and especially in companies that are also capital efficient, do you think that Berkshire needs to explain its investing lens to include more of these leading technology platforms? In other words, do you believe that you need to adapt your model of wide moats and strong brands to embrace, not avoid, technology? I think the answer is maybe. Uh, I, I think the answer is to put her on the board and it'll bring down the average age enormously. We won't get criticized as much. Uh, the, you're, you're exactly right in that uh, we do like moats and we used to be able to identify them in a, in a newspaper that was the only newspaper in town or, or in TV stations where we, where we uh, felt the dominant positions and we felt the, the, uh, the product was underpriced in terms of advertising it. Uh, we saw it in brands sometimes. Uh, and it is true that, that in the tech world, if you can build a moat, it can be incredibly uh, valuable. I've not felt the confidence that I was the best one to judge that in many cases. It, uh, it wasn't hard to figure out who was winning at any given time or what their business was about, but there were a huge number of people that knew more about the game than I did. And we don't want to try and win at a game we don't understand. We may hire people such as Ted and Todd that are, are better at understanding certain uh, uh, areas of investing uh, than I am, or maybe even Charlie is. Uh, but you're, the principles haven't changed. You're right that some of the old ones have lost their moat, and you're, you're right that there are going to be companies in the future that have them that will be enormously valuable, and we hope we can identify one every now and then, but we won't, we'll still stay within what we, where we think we know what we're doing, and obviously we'll make mistakes even within that area. But we won't go into something because somebody else tells us it's a good thing to do. I mean, we, we, we are not going to subcontract your money to somebody else's judgment. You can take your money and, and follow somebody else's judgment, but we're not in the, we're not in the business of, of thinking that if we hire 10 people with specialties in this area or that, that it will lead to superior investment results. And we do worry that we may we could blow a lot of money that way. So we'll do our best to, to enlarge the circle of competence of the people at Berkshire so that we don't miss so many. But we'll, we'll miss a lot in the future. We've missed a lot in the past. The main thing to do is to find things where our batting average is going to be high. And if we miss the biggest ones, that really doesn't bother us as long as, as, long as the things we do with money work out OK. Charlie? Well, I think we've still got an awful lot of companies with big moats, uh, and a lot of them are very, and some of our industrial brands were just incredibly strong in the niches we're in. Uh, so you, the Berkshire shareholders don't need to worry about it. We're just one big morass of unprofitability or anything like that. But we have not covered ourselves with glory in the new fields. We won't end up all in buggy whips, though, or anything. But it's a very good question, and it's what we focus on 
all of the time. And We're hope, trying to improve. And, and we hope you see, we see you back here for your fourth next year. Hi, Warren and Charlie. My name is Rob Lee from Vancouver, Canada. Um, could you please share with us what do you value the most in life now? Thank you. Well, well I'd like to have a little more of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the two things you can't buy, time and love. And that, uh, I value those for a long time. And, and I've been very, very, very lucky in life in being able to control my own time to extreme degree. Charlie's always valued that too. That's that's why we really wanted to have money was so we could do what we damn pleased basically in our life. <laughs> it wasn't six houses or boats or anything. But, well, Charlie's got a boat, but it, it doesn't do us that much good. But but time uh, is valuable, and that's that's uh, and we are very very lucky to be in jobs where. Physical ability doesn't make any difference, and you know we we we've got the perfect job for a couple of guys with aging bodies, and uh, we get to do what we love to do every day. I mean, I literally, uh, I I could do anything that money could buy, pretty much, and uh, I'm having more fun doing what I do than doing anything else. And Charlie is designing designing dormitories, and I mean he he's got an interesting life, and and uh, he brings a lot to it. He still reads, you know, more books in a, in a week than I get done in a month, and he remembers what he reads. And so we've got it very good, but we, we don't have unlimited time. And, and whatever we do to free up the time to do what we like to do, and we both maximize that in our lives, uh, we do. Anybody's lucky if he gets so what he spends his time at, he really likes doing. That's that's a blessing. Yeah, we we've had so much good luck in life. It's it, it sort of blows your mind. Is yeah. starting with being being born in the United States and uh, Canada would be fine too. Incidentally, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you were designing Berkshire to being a steady compounding machine that should continue to create value for a very long time. Would you both please elaborate on this compounding machine and the machine's ability to continue to adapt to keep this value creation durable? Uh, and then is this legacy one of your sort of primary motivations when you wake up every day? I would say it's the, it is the primary motivation, but it's been that for a very, very, very long time. No matter what was going right in my life, the things that were going badly sure I, I would not feel good you know and, uh, I don't need to be spending my time working on something that, that makes me feel bad about the results you know when we get through so I, and it's 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 something that's doable I mean the culture is stronger now than it was 10 years ago and it was stronger then than 10 years previously it moves slowly but it goes in the right direction and when we get chances to deploy the capital we we've always tried to make any entity whether it was the partnership originally or the or Berkshire now, or blue chip snaps when we owned it, or or even diversified retail. We we wanted them all to be compounding, in effect, be compounding machines. That's why people gave us capital. That's why we put our own capital in. And if we failed at it, we feel like we really felt like we'd failed. It didn't make any difference how much money we made from fees or anything like that. We 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 knew what our yardstick was, and, and so that that will continue. I think Berkshire is better situated than it's ever been, except for the fact that size is a drag on performance. And I, I probably wrote that 40 years ago. I wrote it actually when I closed the partnership to new money when we had like $40 million in it. I just said that, uh, that really the new, that additional capital would drag down returns from a $40 million base. So you can imagine how I feel with a $368 billion base of capital in Berkshire now. But, this culture is special. It can work. It won't be the highest compounder by a long shot against many other businesses. I think it won't be, it'll be one of the safest ways to make decent money over time. But uh, 
that will depend on the people that follow us. Charlie? Well, we came a long way from very small beginnings. And the fact that it slows down a little when it becomes monstrous is not my idea of a huge tragedy. I, and I think we will continue to do very well in the future. We had nothing like the energy operation you know, 20 years ago. And it's a powerhouse. We had nothing like Kevin's operation in home building 30 years ago. And it will soon be the biggest. Well, even now, it's better than anybody else in the country. You've got both types of high housing, isn't it? Houses? I think so. And we have a lot going for us, and I'm satisfied. I think it's going to continue reasonably. And it would ruin our life if we did it terribly. <laughs> so that, that's what we wake up thinking about in the morning. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in a business where I was going to let down other people. And I think it'd be crazy to do something like that, even if you weren't rich in 88. <laughs> so uh, it, but we are motivated to have something that, that is regarded as as something different than others, and, and, and we're actually in a world where so much money is institutionalized, you know, uh, I, I like the idea of having somebody that's actually owned by individuals in, in very significant part who basically trust us and, and uh, you know, don't worry about what the next quarter's earnings are going to be. I, I, think, it, I think it's different than much of capitalism, and I think it's a something that Charlie and I feel good about. Yeah, absolutely. The proposals we receive from the investment world, I've got to tell you about one because it, 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 uh, it illustrates go on. We, we received a proposition the other day, and I'll disguise the numbers a little bit so nobody uh, can pick it out. But it was a private company. And we'll say it was earning $100 million a year. But the seller of the business and the investment banker suggested that we should look at the earnings as being $110 million a year. Because as a private company, they had to pay their top people in cash, which was expensed. But we could pay them in stock options and things like that, which weren't expensed or were explained as not really counting, and therefore we would, could report $110 million if we gave away something we didn't want to give away. But by essentially by, by sort of lying about our accounting, we could add $10 million to the earning, and they wanted us to pay them because they couldn't do it, and we could do it, and therefore, at this point, they're losing me, of course, <laughs> totally. But it, it's just astounding the the accounting games that are played, all the adjustments are why the place should really be, will be earning more than before. It's, it's, it's a business. We also had one that came in from a private equity firm and by a mistake, uh, we got the email that was sent to the manager from the email from the private equity firms that owned it to the manager in terms of making projections for it. And they told them to add 15% because they say Buffett will discount it by 15% or 20% anyway. So just, just add 15% to offset his conservatism. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not an elegant business, as Charlie will tell you. <laughs> you have any better stories, Charlie? <laughs> it's bad enough. <laughs> okay, Andrew. It's really very bad enough. 